Our colleagues in primary care, like the GPs, pharmacists, dentists, already do an outstanding job. But the additional support that we have as large foundation trusts, mental health, acute, and others, is usually lacking in primary care. This means ordinary GPs in practices are busy looking after patients. And later in the day, when the practice shuts, they tend to deliver HR, finance, estates, and other important support services that are needed to run services smoothly. At Elft, we were looking at ways in which we could support our primary care colleagues so that they have the same support that we had. Despite these numerous challenges that I have shared with you today, in January 23 alone, across the UK, 29.6 million appointments were delivered by our GP colleagues. 48% of these appointments, so that's literally half, were done by GPs themselves. Interestingly, many of us talk about how difficult it is to get an appointment in GPs. 45.3%, so that's roughly 14 million appointments of the 29.3 were same day appointments that were offered. 70% of these were done face to face. This just talks of the wonderful primary care delivery system that we have in the UK. The enormous respect that our GPs command is really well earned by them. In today's era, we often lack, we often talk of population health, how services are provided for people with long-term conditions, people of an older age group, and they're all extremely important. But as a father of two young girls, aged between 13 and 18, I often worry if we are focusing on our younger adults. This is special room. It's a very special time of your life, which sets you right for the remainder. And today, our guest is one such GP who has developed specific focused social prescribing services for our younger population groups. As a parent, I am immensely grateful of the importance this has given and recognized. Many of you on the call today recognize the importance of making sure the younger adults, kids, they all get the support because it sets them up right. Because we could be parents, we could be godparents, they could be nieces, nephews, we could be aunts and uncles for them. And Dr. Sean Stanley is a GP who needs little mention as the clinical director of Short Valley and Village PCN, the creation of her social prescribing services have made national news. It's also made it in the best practice guidance within the recently commissioned Fuller's Report for Primary Care Services. Despite a number of commitments that Dr. Stanley has, she has very kindly offered today to be at our webinar and share with us the amazing opportunity we would have of sharing this widely. Before I hand over to Sean, I'd like to remind colleagues on, the, on today's uh, webinar, and they're almost, we've just gone over 100 now, that please use the Q&A session on your uh, chart, bar chart down below to post questions after Dr. Sean, uh, Dr. Stanley has shared her views on this new development, we will pull out themes from these questions and ask those so that she's able to share her views. Of course, as usual, many of you have already posted your questions. So we will start with some of those while we add the others that people post today. 
Sean, thank you so much for your time today. Very, very grateful that you've given us. Over to you to share your thoughts. Thank you, Mohit. You're very kind. Uh, I'm not sure I deserve the introduction, but you're, 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 you're very kind. Now, I've got to share my screen, which, as anybody will tell you, is the most hairy part of any of these presentations. So here we go. Eyes down for a look in. Uh, tell me when you can see that. Can you see that? Yes, and if I go yes, big and if I start, tell me, Mohit, reassure me that you can see a lady in orange. We do. We can see Lady Rose. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, so my name is Sean Stanley. I am a GP in Stork Valley in the Villages, and I'll explain where that is in a minute because not everybody will know. I, I'm clinical director since the inception of our primary care network, and I also represent um, clinical directors of the NHS Confederation Primary Care Advisory Board, which has been an interesting role that's definitely evolved uh, and, and definitely expanded my horizons. So who are we, right? This is the key thing, isn't it? So we're a primary care network on the Hertfordshire Essex border. And I think probably the most, the, be the best benchmark for it is Stansted Airport. So we're just by Stansted Airport, if, if, that's, a, uh, if that's any use to anybody. Uh, we've got about 65,000 patients in our primary care network with five practices. Uh, we are an affluent population, so I always sort of feel like I have to say that and sort of almost apologise for it. It doesn't mean that this model that I'm produced uh, wouldn't work anywhere else. It's just that I, I feel like that's important to, to, to state at the beginning. I mean, from my personal perspective, I'm a GP through and through. I don't have any specialist training in um, teenagers or young people. I picked a tricky population, I think we could all agree. Um, and I work three days a week clinically and two days a week as a clinical director. So that's the boring bit. So why did we set up a service? What drove this, this, this need, so to speak? So our population health management data was telling us that there was a large mental health burden across the piece, all ages. And that if we looked at our unplanned admissions going into A&E departments, a lot of them were sort of centered around uh, mental health, substance misuse, um, and a lot of uh, suicidal ideation and parasuicidal attempts. So we, we, we'd had this worry uh, that we were not perhaps able to reach a group of people before crisis hit. We also had noticed an increase in sort of demand in terms of uh, mental health referrals for children and young people. And that only went up significantly after the pandemic. That's, as you know, did not get any better. The pandemic uh, really did exacerbate a lot of this. And we also noticed that we were having a lot of uh, parents concerned about autistic spectrum disorder and uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and that they were complex referrals, um, not, not suited to the 10 minute sort of slot that GPs traditionally had. We had major issues locally with eating disorders, deliberate self-harm, school refusal, anxiety, and that again, post pandemic that escalated, that did not decrease. And so we found we were doing a lot of referrals to CAMS. They were being sent back to us saying, there's tier two intervention, here's a list. Everybody was a bit confused by it all. Uh, and parents, understandably, I think, were getting really frustrated. If your child is in pain, be it psychological pain or physical pain, as, as a parent, I think that produces a visceral response in you. It, it's more important almost than your own pain. And so what would happen is that parents would call over and over again, say, where's this referral? Where's that referral? You and, and it would escalate, you know, their anxiety would be transferred onto us. We'd be like running around and we didn't know how to best help. So all that transference of all that anxiety into primary care, it just meant that we felt that there was this huge unmet need um, and that somehow we wanted to sort of help with that. And of course, the interesting part is that uh, the advent of primary care networks sort of presented an opportunity for us to be able to expand a service and create a service that perhaps met our local needs. And it really was just as simple as that. Uh, we didn't uh, really set out to do anything massively groundbreaking. What we wanted to do was uh, help uh, our young people and um, guide them and uh, prevent 
some of the more established mental health uh, disorders emerging. So I think, I don't know what it's like in your various patches, but certainly for us, it felt like a maze trying to get through. And as a GP trying to remember, oh, you know, what, what service, is this service still going? Or is that, often you'd be referring to services that weren't there anymore, or, or they, they changed their name or the, the different criteria. And you got, all, it was also confusing. And as a GP, just didn't have time to keep up with the various vagaries of, of various services locally. So what did we do? Well, I call it a bit of a Sean special. It was me wandering into the room going, I've, I've, I've got an idea, everybody. Um, and I'm sort of expected it to be poo-pooed, actually. Uh, we had two adult social prescribers already who were excellent and we weren't sort of in, you know, we felt that they were doing a sterling job. And so when PCNs came along and they said, you can have as many social prescribers as you like. And we thought, mm. and I said to uh, the team, I said, do, 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 do you think we should do a children and young people service expecting, you know, no, don't be ridiculous. And actually, I have a really sensible colleague. I have a colleague who's far more sensible than me. And when she said, that's a good idea, I thought, oh, is it wonderful? Well, in which case, I will give it a go. And um, I then went off to the CCG. I had a mentor at the CCG at the time. And I said to her, I said, what do you think? And she said, well, there's nothing in the rules to say you can't do it, Sean. So there we go. That was that was that was their response. So we 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 sort of this sort of Sean special emerged, um, and we decided to employ our social prescriber as a federation. So uh, our federation and our PCN are the same practices, um, and so what we were able to do was to form a job description and to form a contract with our social prescribers directly. So they were not employed by any of the third sector organisations uh, that are, as some social prescribers are, um, and that that gave us a lot of free in terms of being able to organically grow the service, create a bespoke service for our particular population. And I think one of the joys of that is that if you, if you do transport this model to other populations, then you can uh, also organically grow. And the big tip of all of this is get your social prescriber, your young person from the local population if you can, because they understand the area and they understand the needs of that particular area. So at the beginning of the job, uh, we we recruited, and I said to Ben, who we ultimately recruited, uh, "You need an eight week induction. Uh, you don't have to see any patients for eight weeks. You just need to go to all the groups that you're going to be referring into." And we set up a service. And here we go. There is the three of us now. I'll explain who everybody is. So this is Ben and uh, Ed on the other side and Emma and that these will create the children and young people service and the fact that I'm laughing in the middle is it just tells you everything you need to know about how we interact with each other and how enjoyable the, the, the process is and so we now got uh, myself Ed Anthony who's a mental health coach Ben Nesham who's on the left there and Emma who's in the circle who's an occupational therapist and we've got a care coordinator all working on that team uh, looking and trying to help uh, ch children and young people locally and the feedback's been fantastic you know it's been really good we've had about a thousand young people now go through the service uh, and uh, so the way it works is that a patient presents via primary care uh, doesn't matter which clinician or which person they're presenting via uh, but they are all primary care referrals. They have to be registered with one of the five practices that are in the PCN. And uh, they will be referred to Ben, who is uh, he will set up an initial interview with people. And Ed is a mental health coach, so he will work with uh, patients. And I'll come back to him in a minute. And then we have Emma, who works with autistic and ADHD patients um, and does an amazing job with them. And again, I'll come back to what she does in more detail in a minute. So, yay, we set the service up. And uh, how do we keep it safe? And I think this is the thing. I mean, I when I was um, in uh, when I was doing my psychiatry job as an SHO or whatever you call whatever that's called these days, um, I had my first experience of supervision and I had my first experience of what it felt like for somebody to create the time to sit down and talk about 
cases and your worries about those cases and learning from those people. And I was an absolute convert to the concept of supervision. And so when we set the service up, I knew that the, this, this can be a hard group. OK, it's not without its risks. It's not without its pushbacks and it's not without its frustrations. And so we keep the service safe by supervision. And when I talk about that, I talk about it in the biopsychosocial model. And I'll come back. I've got another slide about this in a minute because we we said right you every tuesday for an hour i will spend i will sit down and the th four of us will get together and we will go through cases that are concerning any of us that's myself included and we'll talk about the referrals and we'll talk about what's going on and any safeguarding issues that have arisen and any issues that come around with confidentiality Again, I'll come back to that in a minute, because I think that there is a few key issues around those things when you are doing social prescribing and so supervising. So we not only do they have an hour with me, but once a month they have an hour supervision with a, a, a family and children's psychotherapist called David and David. Um, the deal we have with David is it's a very simple deal. I say we will pay for supervision with you to help. Uh, with the with the with the issues that are arising around social prescribing, um, the the Ben and Ed and Emma and all the social prescribers get this adults as well. Um, they they can talk about whatever they like and it's completely confidential. But if you think that there's any risk to any of the patients, then the deal is you break that confidentiality. You tell me. So whenever they are, whenever they are set up for for the, the supervision, the, the the they are told that if there's any, if David has any concerns about behaviours, if David has any concerns about management, then then he will tell me. But other than that, what they talk about with David is entirely up to them. Uh, and I think sometimes it's been personal, you know, and I and I don't see that as an issue. I think that's good. What that's meant is we've been able to retain staff. We've recruited and we've retained, and I know that. There's been a lot of issues with social prescribing around the feeling of being supported and the feeling of not being isolated. Uh, I think it can feel that way, especially if you're a satellite to the practices. And so this is a very clear indication to our team. We value you. We want you to stay with us. We, um, we, you know, we, we, we hear you. We hear you properly. And um, I have to say, it's the best hour I have a week. We we just, we learn so much from each other. And it's not just about me saying, you know, but ultimately there is a risk that sits with me because, you know, things are going through me. They have, Ben and Emma have full access to records. So uh, you'll see, and I, uh, I'll i tell you why that is in a minute. Um, but these are the group of young people, though I did have their permission to put this up. They, uh, they did they have a group on a Monday at Thirst Cafe, which is our local youth cafe. Um, and so we went down there to talk to them about what they thought about the service. <laughs> and, you know, they're just sort of typical teenagers. They went, oh, it's all right, it's fine. I said, anything you want us to do? No, no. You know, don't, don't, don't talk to me. <laughs> Please leave me alone. You know, who is this crazy woman coming in to talk to me? I don't want to talk to her. <laughs> so there we go. So, uh, and I say this is this is my only swearing, and I am notorious for swearing, so please forgive me, but there's no bloody forms. There's no forms I refuse. The forms are the new F word, in my view. Forms, the biggest barrier to referral ever created by mankind. So uh, this is why Ben and Emma have full access to records. I don't believe that they we should have to fill out a form in, in addition to writing in patients' notes. So when we refer, it is simply a task or an email email to Emma or Ben saying an outline this is what's going on would you make contact with this person please see the records and they duly do that so there's no and there's no such thing as no there may be a point where they think it's not right and we will talk about that in supervision but the default position is always yes the default position is yes we will reach out to that young person we might not be the right people but we will be there, we will not reject that referral. So there's no rejected referrals. The only fly in that ointment has been with Emma because she's doing a lot of the ADHD and ASD referrals for us, that's been very time consuming. And so that's why we've got a care coordinator to help her to be able to increase the flows through that system. And that, that is the point about it sitting in primary care. 
it's a primary care service, ours, set up by GPs for GPs to help with workload. One thing Ben has that I do not have is time. He has the capacity to be able to sit and talk to the young person about what's going on in their lives and, and how it's affecting them. And, and uh, same, same as with Emma and, and with Ed. Ed's role now has evolved, and, and I'm, I'm a great believer in the sort of organic development of services as well, which I think primary care and general practice in particular is really good at, um, at, at enabling, really, partly because of the way we're set up. But the, the, the organic nature of it has been that Ed, although originally was brought in to sort of talk about self-esteem and positive thinking and all that sort of thing with young people, actually what he's become is more of a mentor to the parents so for parents who've had having a difficult time and helping them to negotiate that teenager journey in a positive and supportive way to parents and they are not parenting classes absolutely not no way Jose we do not do that but what we do is we let parents share frustrations and he may say to them well have you thought about looking at it in this particular way or do you think that could be a more positive way of helping uh that person and that young person and, and really bringing them into uh sort of into a more positive frame of mind so we've definitely had a drop in our cams referrals that, that i think if that was replicated it would be a generally a good thing because what that is allowing is the patients who really need to be with cams can then get appointments with cams um and realistically you're you're, you're freeing up the system um, and we've got a very high patient and uh, GP satisfaction. GPs love it and love it. I'll tell you why in a minute, but it's great. So, yeah, it's great. I mean, I don't know how many of you are, are, are familiar with George Engel. 1977 set up the sort of biopsychosocial model. I'm sure it had been invented before that, but he was the one that wrote it up. And uh, this is a very key part of the service. It's It's not just about uh social prescribing it's not just about the psyche but it's the combined it's a very flattened hierarchy as a result the acknowledgement that each of us is the is as important as each other in that team um i don't prescribe for under 18s uh, ssri prescribing at least um our local cam service still does that but there will be occasional di special dispensation when i can work with cams and they will guide me and help me to prescribe if, if they think it's appropriate but i never initiate without cams approval so um but what i think is really important is this self-awareness active cultivation of trust an emotional style characterized by empathy and curiosity i mean these are all so important and it's what we want as patients but i think it's also what young people really need and i think they can often feel that their autonomy is a little lacking because of their uh the, the stage in their lives and so this sort of you know trying to work with them on, a, on an equal footing is, is is important in this service but the last point i think on there is commuting so communicating clinical evidence to foster dialogue but not just the mechanical application of protocol. It is so easy, I think, with the medical litigation and all the things that go on around us and the fear factor of, of how people are, that we can just be driven by protocols. Clearly, we have protocols. Clearly, we have safety protocols. Clearly, we have confidentiality protocols. But beyond that, there is a lot of freedom in the service to try and help um, create space for that young person to find out what they're doing. So we're trying to put the pieces of that jigsaw puzzle together um, and really create that sort of perfect biased psychosocial uh, system which 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 really helps that person. When we set up the service, we decided 11 to 25 was where we were going to aim the service. I, I have to say, I have very few regrets about this, but the only regret I have is that we didn't go younger. I think we could have done, I just don't think that I felt as a GP supervising that I had the expertise to go down. I think what I've realised is that um, we could work really well with school nurses. I think I think they need some support at the moment. And I think that we could probably and I think we're looking at increasing the age range uh, from that Thrive model. Uh, was it Freud? Uh, Bella is it Bella Freud, I think. I'm a Freud, I'm a bit confused. Uh, uh, who set up the Thrive model. So what matters to me, making the young person the centre of it all. We get, try and give them six sessions. I mean, Ben 
he's, he's hopeless. I'm sure he sneaks a few extra in without, without letting me know. Uh, um, but they are all primary care referrals. We don't take referrals from schools, which I think has been a bit controversial. Uh, and, and my only reason for doing it was just because of the demand um, and the fact that uh, we felt that uh, that lot, a lot more mental health was presenting via primary care than people realised. I think the, the assumption is often that it presents at schools, but actually we get a lot of parents coming to us all the time. And uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, those outcomes were, you know, that th th we, we were really kind of making sure we had enough space for GPs to refer into. Uh, but the cases are left open. We call, that's, that's the compromise I took with Ben eventually. He said, well, can I just leave them on my list and then they can contact me when they want. So he gives them their mo his mobile number. He's got work mobile and an email and he reaches out to them and he does virtual consultations, face to face consultations. Really what makes what works for the 11 to 25 year old themselves. Um, and he uh, essentially then signposts them to a various different services. Probably the biggest, I think the biggest opportunity with this particular model is early intervention and stopping the concept of CAMS being a destination in of itself. It, it, it is awful when patients are told, anybody is told, oh, you're not unwell enough for this service. What does that mean? Does that mean that you have to get more unwell? Do I get more unwell? Do I do more, more unwellness to be able to get myself into CAMS? Um, and therefore, because it was sort of felt that CAMS was really the, 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 the destination of choice, as it were, I think that's why everybody was up in the ante. Whereas what we're saying is actually, why don't we come in earlier than that? Why don't we come in earlier than that, that, that where we would traditionally refer to CAMS or to tier two services and we acknowledge that everybody has a need. It doesn't matter if we, you know, what, what, it doesn't matter about diagnosis, it doesn't matter about anything. What matters is you have got a perception of need and that we will help you with that need. And I think one of the biggest things that have come about, of course, is uh, early intervention within eating disorders. Um, that is in, in, a, in of its own right, quite a frightening, as you know, uh, with the highest mortality rates of any psychiatric uh, disease. Uh, the longer duration of um, untreated symptoms is a significant uh, predictor of poorer outcomes in, um, and according to BEAT, who the eating disorder service, the third sector of eating disorder service, um, the average time from the sort of start of symptoms of an eating disorder to being seen within an eating disorders unit is about three and a half years. So early intervention is actually considered anything less than three years, which I still think is, is, is far too long. It'd be good if we, I mean, we should be, I think, as GPs trying to help in the very first contact that we have with anybody who's got a potential eating disorder or perception of an eating disorder. And uh, I think it was, again, in the same sort of paper, 69% uh, of patients who presented to their GP with what they felt was an eating disorder uh, felt that their GP did not know what to do with it. And I understand that because I don't think I would know what to do with it because you could only refer one particular BMI. I know that some areas have early intervention services for eating disorders. So forgive me if you do have one of those. We do not have one of those locally. And so we were really basing all our referrals on BMIs, which is, you know, a, a kind of slightly unreliable. But not only that, but but uh, it was almost an achievement to get your BMI to a point where you might be referred to eating. I mean, that's not a that's not an achievement that we should be endorsing or encouraging. So uh, what we said now is that anybody who's got uh, the merest whiff of an eating disorder will be referred to psychological support, uh, looking at local dietitians, et cetera, et cetera. So that's been really, uh, I think, from my perspective, um, incredibly important. All, But all into early intervention makes a massive difference within uh, most uh, serious psychiatric illnesses will start to evolve in teenage uh, years and we've picked up quite a few early psychosis, uh, possibly patients who may not have presented to well into their mid twenties, just because we've been able to have that time both with families and with the person to really get to the bottom of those stories um, and uh, really know when and where to refer into, etc. So we set up an art group. Sounds awful, doesn't it? We set up an art group. I didn't set up an art group. 
Bone set up an art group and they get a professional artist in on a Friday at our local art centre. And we are particularly focusing on school refusal. So the kids that aren't going to school, we try and get them into this place on a Friday where they can interact with other people, mental health practitioners, etc. And they do a big, uh, what do you call it, show? Not show is not the right word, is it? But anyway, you know what I mean. Uh, at the end of it all, and they uh, display all their artwork and it's uh, very, very well received. We fund that as a PCM. So I can't remember how much, but it's not a huge amount of money, but we do pay for that. We pay for that from our IIF. Uh, part. Uh, we are doing a project with the uh, YMCA at the moment around our young homeless and access to healthcare and making sure that they've got everything, you know, screening, vaccinations, everything that they need as well. So uh, although we live in an affluent area, actually, funnily enough, homelessness is a problem because it's so expensive to live here. No one can actually afford to rent. So there's a lot of sofa surfing. There's a lot of uh, people who would not know uh, what not know where to call home particularly so we are reaching out to those people and we also take our local church takes a whole uh, homeless population in the winter which we want to work with we've been working with Cordwell Youth uh, it used to be called Aspire a Cordwell Youth uh, are a mentorship program and again we pay Cordwell Youth uh, to mentor some of the young people traditionally originally this was set up as uh, uh, people who were likely to become involved with the criminal justice system but actually, it, now it's anybody who needs some specialist mentoring um, and Caldwell Youth are working with us on that. Uh, families first. And also, I'm a passionate believer in physical health as well as mental health and about making sure that the there is the physical health offer, you know, to try and improve mental health. So uh, our local gym has a class uh, specifically that, that we can refer into. And uh, the, uh, the chap who runs it's brand new, it's gorgeous. It's a lovely gym if you fancy a day out. Um, and uh, they they work really hard with the young people and run classes uh, for them. And again, that's funded through uh, uh, actually funny, as, as a sort of uh, health coach, a physical health coach. YGAM have been involved with this. They're doing some work around um, uh, education years on uh, gaming and gambling. Again, not something I necessarily know a lot about. But so if a young person came to me and said, I'm gambling, I would say, I mean, I suppose my instinct would say don't, but I'm not sure that's helpful. So I think you've got to kind of have an idea in your mind about what you're going to say, what you're going to do, how you're going to kind of work with them. So why are working with us uh, to try and uh, use some evidence based uh, strategies to try and uh, help, particularly with gaming. It's a big problem. I don't know if any of you have had this in your areas. Uh, and we have Youth Connections and Youth YCT Hearts um, and, of course, BEAT, who I'm very fond of as, a, as, a, as an organisation because I think they are picking up a lot of very uh, difficult uh, cases. But BEAT uh, do do some early intervention work for us. So we did. We've done we've done really well. I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, I love the fact that I've got all these things, but I have to also put this out. To be fair, we haven't actually won anything yet. Um, we are. <laughs> We love. We do try. We keep. We keep putting ourselves in for these things, and then we've we've got that sort of Oscar face, you know, when you lose, like, oh, that's fine, that's lovely. Uh, and I think we're on number three of these events now. So eventually, eventually, we might, we might, we might get it over the line. But but it doesn't matter too much. The the idea being that we're trying very hard to get the word out there that that this is what we did. This is this is this is positive. Uh, within primary care we want to keep it in primary care we very much want it to be part of our future as part of our primary care team we very much want to keep it at the heart of what we do uh, but I think in order to do that I think we have to support our third sector colleagues who work so incredibly hard with our young people um, and I think we have to and then that's why we don't mind funding uh, places with Cordwell Youth is supposed to be cookery classes we do as well and we don't mind funding that because we don't want to just be a net drain on the third sector we want to be able to support it um, and I think we need to start working closely with our commissioners to make sure that they are getting the support and the funding that they need to be able to carry on um, and I think you know there is an ongoing debate about who should be employing social prescribers should it be PCNs and federations or should it be other organizations outside that um, but it's worked well for us to do it in this way and, and I don't think we will particularly change that but we will we are looking to recruit for a younger person social prescriber 
So as was mentioned, we were in the fuller stock take. We had a we had a visit from the fuller stock take team uh, as a sort of positive example of what primary care networks could do uh, from a standing start. So uh, that was all very nice, and and I, and I uh, bandied that around a lot. Um, and so it really is just about uh, the future for us really is about creating a network of social subscribers, possibly across the country. So if any of you are interested, um, we would quite like to just do that and learn from each other and continue to grow organically based on uh, our experiences about how we um, how we want to how we see the world and what we've done, but also to share the risks um, and to share some of, of some of the issues as well because it's not all plain sailing you know there is issues around confidentiality and safeguarding etc um which you know is a whole different um discussion which i'm happy to share but i think that is possibly the most the biggest stresses but what's what's interesting is by keeping it in primary care of course we know everybody we know the families and we know the, the other families so the, the, the sort of the families that know the other family are like, oh they know so yeah and oh and there's oh so you can piece a whole whole sort of social <laughs> network together so we are uh I, I think we are you know we are very well placed to do it but anyway I will, I will hand back over now and, and I hope now let's let, the other stressful thing is now to stop sharing how do I stop sharing let's see if I can stop sharing uh, um, um I mean the, the chat box is a buzz with the number of comments. People are loving it. I can see the hearts and the thumbs up going throughout. Um, I think I think just the kind of conversation we wanted to have today because it touches many of us, kids do, and they are future leaders if we can't help them and make sure they're secure. And it's interesting. I think um, my daughters, I shared they're of an age between 13 and 19. They don't see themselves as kids anymore. The conversation with them is a lot more insightful than it used to be when I was of that age. They are well informed, they have done their research. So it does require a special attentive service that gives them the care that is really tuned to their needs. And you're right, I mean, I find it easier. If I ring my kids, they almost never pick up the phone. If I Snapchat them, I do get a message response back. And I'm only on Snapchat so I can talk to my kids. It's much easier to do it then. So I think a um, number of questions here, a number of questions. But I'll start with the one that's perhaps the most important, Vishwan, because people love the service. There is no one who hasn't said anything. In fact, there's an ANP from your PCN who's logged on, and she talks about how highly she thinks of the service. I think the question that does come is, Having a service, and I love the fact that you have no forms because I also commission uh, children and young people beds for the whole of North, North Central and Northeast London. I'm a commissioner for all of that. And so that's across six different trusts, different services, all the camp services I commissioned through that. But the bit around that really touched my heart was the ease of referrals. Mm. So from where can, can a young person refer themselves into this service so that actually they know that they are struggling. They know they are being bullied. They know they are having a difficult time. They know they are, they are anxious for either exams or eating disorders, and they want to speak to someone confidentially. How do they do that? And how do you make sure they are aware of a service like this? Well, we, Ben and I go out to, to the schools. We do ask them to come through primary care simply because of the risk assessment. Um, because I'm not there to risk assess when they, you know, I don't know. I don't. I, maybe this is something that can evolve, and I, and I'm and I'm really open to that. I know it was just something that we set up as a sort of safety mechanism, which would it be people would be assessed by a GP or a clinician in the first instance, and then be referred into primary. And and, and of course, that a lot more mental health was presenting to primary care than than people expected because of the anonym well, anonymity. You know, it's anonymous going to your GP, so you could be there for anything. You you didn't have to be there to talk about your mental health, or you didn't have to be there to talk about. Uh, what was going on you could be there for your sore throat and so what we found was a lot of young people were presenting in that way so we we kept it that like I say everything evolves and 
I think once the case is open to Ben and Ed and the team, then then they tend to stay open with Ben and Ed and the team and then they re-risk assess. But I think possibly now, as we're getting a bit more confidence, that might change. But at the moment, that's how we set it up, just for our own peace of mind, really. I mean, clearly, um, Ben and Ed seem to be uh, a force to reckon with. They have kept <laughs> well, kept funny enough... Alive. The secret zeitgeist that's coming up on the outside lane, of course, is Emma, because the, the the volume of ADHD, ASD referrals that she's getting through, I mean, especially because it's such a complex form, you know, it's such a complex referral pathway, and you always feel like you're sending the, everybody to the wrong space. Is it child development? Is it mental health? So uh, she's coming way up on that. And, and of course, what I haven't mentioned is she does an autistic traits pathway where anybody all age can book with her through the GP um, if they've got autistic traits so what we said was it doesn't matter if you've got a diagnosis it doesn't matter where you're up to on that journey if you have sensory processing if you feel that things aren't quite right or you're having problems with relation she because she's a trained occupational therapist she can use those those uh, skills to help so it's all evolving. It's it's quite interesting um, how it's all evolving. And I must say, some of the parents who've been involved with Emma, with children who aren't diagnosed, who are waiting for diagnosis with ASD, have been, I mean, I've got a card here that makes me cry every time I read it, how grateful people are just to be able to give be given some practical help with children that they don't, and they don't want to get it wrong. People don't want to get it wrong. That's the point. They're like, what should I tell them off? Should I not tell them off? What should I just do? You know, and so it's all about that really and making sure that, you know, Emma is very good at helping. Um, oh, it's, it's, it's fantastic. You know, everybody should have an OT. Everybody should have an OT in primary care. I never, I didn't really know what um, mental health OTs did before, but uh, now I do. They're brilliant. <laughs> we should all have one. Yeah, <laughs> A big shout out for the OD crowd, you who. Um, <laughs> I, I think we have a couple of questions with colleagues who are experienced social prescribers wanting to understand if they wanted to step into this arena, is there some specialist training that they'd have to think through? Or if not, how do they actually become um, conversant with what's needed? Well, there isn't at the moment. I think Health Education England are setting something up, actually. Um, um, we we are running, um, like, no, 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 I wouldn't call it a course particularly. We just sort of, we're hoping to gather a network of people to support and show what we've got, you know, how, we, how we've how we done things, just so that we can support other children and young people, social prescribers. Um, I think that they are getting increasingly needed, in particular in, in, in deprived areas. And I think there may well be some special training around sort of safeguarding and things like that that need to happen. Um, and it, but I do also think that it's about recruiting for values. So we recruited Ben for values. Now, I know that's a bit of a, a funny old catch-all term. What it means is that we got somebody who knew the local population who had, he had a, he was a social working assistant uh, in the past. He wasn't a social worker himself, but he had, so he had some experience of um, and Emma has had some experience of working in the in forensic um, pediatric unit. So we, we had some experience, but I wouldn't say it's uh, it's all about the person. And, and, and can you connect with I mean, Ben connects with these young people really well. And, and, and they want to keep, you know, part of the problem is they want to keep coming back. I mean, one of the one of the downsides of it is over dependency and, and and making sure that the boundaries are in place from the get-go that they know that, that Ben's not their new best friend he's not their therapist he's an, he, it's a link worker he's there to help them show them other services that, that 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 they get linked into so I think that that would be my advice and I've always been quite airy sort of fuzzy about that I and mean, it drives people crazy because like, why can't I have a course if I just do this qualification on a point A to point B but I'm not sure I, yeah <laughs> And, and I think there's, there's something around your personal um, circumstances to people who want to do this. Is that they have the interest? Because as a clinician, many of us go into fields that just attract us and then they become specialists in that area. So I think it's the same for social prescribers. They are becoming an evolving clinical yes. arena. And it's really important to make sure we are able to tap into their innate interests and what they want to do so they can give the best to the local population. And, and I think there, there, there are a number of questions here from colleagues who are talking about how can they get the service to their area. So let me answer that if, that, if I may, um, Sean. I think um, use this webinar 
quote this to your GPs and ask them to stop the service. It isn't something any of us can do, but actually as local residents of that area, it is for you to share this. I mean, the whole point of these webinars is take them out, share them. They are always available. Um, the link is put out for everyone. Share this with your local GP and ask them that you'd like the PCN to run something like this. And, and if I could just say, Mohit, just, just an aside there, that in terms of GP workload, it helps. Uh, the reason, and this is how you, you, you I, I mean, I'm not sure that that's why we set it up. I hasten to add, I just know that it has helped. So, for example, you know, the other day I had a busy duty doctor session, really busy, um, too, too busy, really. And then I've got a young person who's sort of in crisis, who's not suicidal, they're not suicidal, that's different. I, that, that obviously I have to sort of support that, but a patient who wants to sort of reach out to one of us. Uh, and I can drop a line to Ben and say, would you mind just, just checking he's okay? Uh, and that's, a, that's, that's helpful. That is really, really helpful. Um, and if he says, no, Sean, I'm sorry, you've got to speak to them because they're, they're, they're too poorly. I'm, I'm worried about them. Then obviously that's 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 done. But actually, a lot of the time people just just need to talk to somebody at that particular moment in time. And he's able to work very quickly like that. Um, and so it's really, really helped me uh, in my workload, definitely. And I think it has a lot of the GPs across the patch. I think there's something around um, a number of parents commenting on the worried well, because parents are parents. I mean, I, I always think my daughter isn't eating enough. And I think it's a perpetual dinner time conversation. Have another chapati, have some rice. And from her, I've had enough, I had lunch, I had late dinner, I had a late snack, you know, those things that happen. But I think as parents often, the comfort we derive from a service like this to know there is a point of referral where there can be an independent conversation, which, which will benefit because it is different to talking to a dad or a mom or a sister or a godparent or an uncle or an aunt who have always been in the case of why don't you study, where's your homework, why don't you dress better? Why? It, it dilutes the impact of how the support can be given. So I think it's, it's brilliant to hear what you're doing. And, and just to understand, Sean, is there any um, attempt now to extend it into becoming more preventive rather than continue to be um, a point of referral once there are issues? How are you good? How, what, are you, what are your plans for that? Well, I mean, don't forget, we've only been going since <laughs> 2019. <laughs> I'm going that long. Uh, but no, you're right. Of course, that's the absolute. I mean, the early intervention work is one of those things that when you do a service like this and, it, and you realise where it could benefit, where it could really benefit. And the problem, of course, of that is the outcomes might not be for many, many years. How do you prove you, you, you had that? But maybe, maybe I don't mind about that anymore. I, I think ultimately early intervention work has got to be the right thing. Um, and so, yes, is the answer to your question. Of course, we should be doing more of it. Um, and I, but I do think that would be quite sit quite nicely with schools as well. Um, but sometimes schools are part of the problem, not part of the solution. And I don't mean that against any of the schools at all, but we do have a lot of school refusal at the moment. Um, and we do have a lot of uh, children who are really struggling with school. So I, I think what we're trying to do now, we're, we're working with young minds to try and think about how we can uh, do some early intervention work with school refusal. Because I would imagine it's difficult to go back to school if you've been off for a while. Uh, those barriers get bigger and bigger and bigger, don't they? It's a bit like work, isn't it? You, you know, the longer you're off work, the harder it is to get back. So uh, what we thought we'd do is we'd, we'd pick some sort of topics that we sort of felt or saw a lot of um, and certainly school refusal it started with eating disorders but now school refusal was a big 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 problem now post-pandemic I don't know why but that's why we're going to get some experts in to help us understand why and help us to to work to get better outcomes yeah. Sounds absolutely brilliant. And it, it's we want to, yeah, we want to work with parents on that actually. What we want to do is do a, a webinar where clinicians, parents, and all the healthcare workers get together and we can talk about it from our own perspectives and, and, and school about, professionals. And, and school, school professionals, yeah. And say get, and yeah. also look at the law. We don't know what the law is, you know. You know we don't, what is exactly. Law? We don't know. It's amazing how much of insight you can get from the dinner ladies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody what they're children, doing. Yeah. They know those children by name. They can tell actually that one, no, no, not eating very well. This one, I wouldn't worry. They're okay. And it's amazing when you get that. 
but it would be so interesting to hear from the parents like we can't get them to school yes. yeah and then there's us going well we don't know what to do about that and then there's the professionals going well this is what I would do and so working together actually um to to help with this because it's a big 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 and I, and I think initiatives like this also help retain staff because you give them something meaningful that actually engages them, something that rings true with your heart. And then they tend to retain to that kind of a place to say, I mean, I know there are questions being asked about how do you retain people? I think you retain people by creating roles which attra actually attract clinicians. They're roles people want to come and work for. If you have state roles, I'm afraid then you don't get people who want to come to you. Well, it, I mean, I, I don't know. I think when I retire, I'll just supervise children and young people, social prescribers up and down the country, because I think I honestly think that, that it's such a valuable, it's such a, their, their role, to my mind, their role is, is, is vital. I didn't know anything about social prescribers, particularly before I started being a clinical director. And I'm a massive convert, massive convert. I think and, uh, so I think that, you know, I, 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 I would love just to, I might even become one myself when I retire, you know, just, <laughs> just socially prescribed. I, I mean, given, given I'll always be a dad, even when I'm in my nineties and I refuse to admit I'm getting close to my sixties, I think what I'll do is I'll refer my kids even then on to you there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they could be in their late thirties, but it doesn't matter. They'll be kids for me. I will always see them as a dad. <laughs> I think there are a couple of other questions that are really interesting, and I know we are running out of time, so I'm going to ask you just one question around um, the demand. Clearly, this is a service people would love in your area, and so many comments people are talking. What's the kind of demand and waiting times and your service to get in for kids now if they're referred today? Depends on the pathway. Uh, Emma's, Emma's been a bit bogged down because it's just it's just been the volume of work. But I think that's that's resolved now. That that's great. I mean, it's such a good service that we want it to. Keep. You've got to keep your churn. So uh, this is this has always been the debate with you know me and Ben is it's like you have to keep the churn because the problem has always been that just because you don't see that there's all these children out there with these problems doesn't mean they don't exist. So you have to keep the turnover so that everybody gets a chance to. To, to, to be part of that service. And so we see a move on quite quickly um, but within the social prescribing element of this, less so the health coaching and the uh, occupational therapy side of things, but, but from a social prescribing point of view, you have to keep the churn high um, so that you can keep going um, and um, making sure that you are referring into services quite quickly. And, uh, and if there was one indicator that week. that you told you it was successful, what would you use for that? Well, see, now I've done that. I've tried to get some outcome. I'm a hopeless academic. I mean, anybody who's ever worked with me will know that I do try. I try all the time to get published, but I'm never I'm doomed to never actually be published. But anyway, that's fine. I, I've, I've come to terms with it. <laughs> I'm OK with it. But two outcomes, we, we, we're going to focus on two outcomes. One is the clinical satisfaction rating about this. How has it impacted our clinical work to know that this service exists and how is there a high satisfaction rating and, and looking at that. But the second thing is um, also to get the feedback from the children and young people, notoriously difficult group to kind of harness, um, but we will, I think, one day. At the moment, we're just so in the thick of deliver service delivery that we sort of haven't got that headspace to sort of step back and sort of do it all because of the ethics approvals, et cetera. But that, the outcome, actually, to be honest with you, it, we see it every day. I didn't tell you we had an open day just before we yeah, we had an open day, and uh, we did it at a local youth cafe, and it was brilliant. It was lovely. Of course, we did it in the morning, but teenagers don't get up uh, till about 1 o'clock. <laughs> So we sort of trickled in at the end when we were all packing up. <laughs> so top tip, all right. Apparently they like to sleep in the mornings. And in fact, the guy who ran the cafe said to us afterwards, he said, I probably would have done that in the afternoon if I were you. And we sort of said, why? And it's because it's diff there's a, just a different body clock with teenagers. And it's scientifically proven, isn't it, that they, that they do like to sleep in. So that's fine. But it was just funny, that was all. Uh, so yes, um, Sorry, I, I digressed then. I was just uh, I was just reminiscing on this sort of day. <laughs> it's a really good point you raise. We create services and expect people to conform to them. <laughs> Actually, we have to create services that work for people. Exactly. And people will come. It's, it's, it's exactly that. 
we talk about the difficult and hard to reach groups. The groups aren't difficult and hard to reach, it's the services that are difficult and hard to reach. If we could get that right, the groups will be there. People want it. I think it's important to reflect and learn as well. I, I, I know there are some funny comments in the, in the chat box. <laughs> I know, but I, did, yeah, I just didn't happen. think. We just didn't think. We thought, oh, we'll just, we'll just do it at nine o'clock. Of course, we'll have cups of coffee for them. We'll have this, we'll have that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think one of the one of the um, challenges with the presenter like you is an art is never enough, and unfortunately oh, we are drawing close to an end. <laughs> so and and I have run these webinars for over a an year now. This has been running, and I've constantly been impressed by the amazing transformation that a number of GP colleagues have shared here. Today was one of those days when it was a both head and heart moment, you know? Um, when I was a doctor, I was genuinely impressed by the transformation you have brought to parents, to families, to children, to the community. And you've kept the focus live on the child, which is so important in every service we deliver. But then as a father, it brings me absolute joy to know in primary care in the future, my children, their children, my nieces, nephews, those of my friends, and many of the colleagues who are online today, for them to have that, there would be some resilience created because of people like you who have led the way in making a difference. I think we owe it to the future leaders we will be handing these services to at some day to make sure they are resilient right from the early onset, the word go. And your leadership has shown through that, Sean. Thank you so much for your time today. And I'm very grateful for the fact that you gave us this time. Thank you. To colleagues online, thank you so much because there were over 120 of you at points in this webinar. Almost 300 of you have registered. So I know many of you see it later, just so that the registry means you have access to the link. Um, if you enjoyed the webinar, please use the QR code that has been put up on the uh, screen. You can see um, Sarah has quickly put that up. So please do use that QR code so you can comment on it and give us the feedback because we love your feedback. It helps us shape the future webinars over the last year and a half. The changes that have come in this webinar have only come because of the interest you all have shown. And I'm very, very grateful for that. Next month on the 19th of April at 7 p.m., we have Dr. Geraldine Hoban, who will be sharing the innovation that's happening at Foundry Healthcare, another colleague in the community turning the world around so we have better care. Before I close for today, one last set of thank yous to the amazing Sara and the absolutely wonderful Bahana, who in the background have made sure this event goes flawlessly with over 300 registration. It is quite a job to keep this live. And with all Luddites like me, who are not very good at digital technology, I rely on them completely. Sarah and Fahana, thank you for your time. And thank you everyone for a wonderful evening. And thank you, Sean, again. Have a great evening. Bye everyone.